to today's WGO's webinar on pregnancy and liver disease, navigating the complexities on a global scale. We have an excellent program with global representation from different resource settings. A big thank you to WGO staff who worked tirelessly behind the scenes to bring this to fruition, our expert panel of speakers for their willingness to take time from their busy schedule and to all of our attendees. I'm Alice Lee, I'm a hepatologist from Sydney, Australia, and it's my privilege to chair today's webinar and then present on the physiological changes in pregnancy. We'll then hear from Professor Iba Saeed from Egypt on the management of chronic liver disease with particular focus on women with cirrhosis. Professor Mustafa Benazouiz from Morocco will follow through on viral hepatitis in pregnancy. Professor Maria Cabrera from Peru will complete the talks on chronic liver disease in pregnancy with her update on autoimmune hepatitis, MAFLD, and the approach to management of liver lesions. In the second part of the webinar, we'll hear about pregnancy-specific liver disorders from Professor Muhammad El Kassas from Egypt, who'll speak on intrahepatic cholestasis of pregnancy and HELP syndrome. And our final speaker, Professor Suna Yapali from Turkey, will summarize the findings on preeclampsia and acute fatty liver of pregnancy. Pregnancy represents a unique and challenging time as we consider the health of both the mum and the baby, with disorders that are unique to pregnancy, as well as optimizing the care of the woman with chronic liver disease who fall pregnant. Understanding normal physiological changes is central in our evaluation of new as well as managing the additional stresses on the pregnant mother with chronic liver disease. Physiological changes in pregnancy, including symptoms, signs and lab changes, can have overlapping features of liver disease so that distinguishing the two can be a challenge. Pregnancy is associated with increased plasma volume and cardiac output, reduced systemic and splanchnic vascular resistance and activation of the renin angiotensin outer steroid system, mimicking changes that we see in patients with chronic liver disease or exacerbating the features of portal hypertension. The physical changes due to increased estrogen in pregnancy, such as spider neva and palmar erythema, can also lead to clinical suspicions of a new diagnosis of chronic liver disease. Key lab changes that occur during the progressive trimesters of pregnancy is summarized in this table. The increased plasma volume leads to hemodilution, and hence we see progressive decline in hemoglobin throughout the trimesters. This is associated with an expectant decline in the hematocrit. Platelet counts also fall, mostly towards the lower end of normal, with about 10% of women developing gestational thrombocytopenia, with platelet counts dropping to 100 and 150. Lower and more rapidly falling platelet count warrants further intervention. Although pregnancy is a pro-coagulant state, the coagulation profile and the partial thromboplastin time remains unchanged. The alkaline phosphatase increases predominantly in the third trimester, originating from the placenta and from the fetal skeleton. Albumin levels decline progressively due to the effects of hemodilution. Decreased AOT and gamma GT levels are seen in the third trimester, while the AST levels remain unchanged throughout the pregnancy. No significant changes are seen within bilirubin levels with pregnancy. AFP levels from the fetal skeleton is raised in pregnancy. Hence, in summary, ALT, AST, bilirubin and prothrombin time are unchanged in pregnancy, so the elevations in these results should be evaluated further. On the other hand, normal pregnancy changes lead to increases in ALP and AFP as well. However, an increase in ALP associated with an increase in gamma GT together can be a signal for biliary disease and warrant further investigation. Whether a new liver disease is diagnosed or monitoring chronic liver disease is required, imaging may be required for the pregnant woman. Ultrasound is a preferred primary modality to evaluate hepatic and biliary system with the best safety profile. When further imaging is required, MRI without gadolinium, which can cross a placenta, and is excreted by the fetal kidney, associated with a higher risk of stillbirth and neonatal birth, is preferred over CT as it avoids the need for radiation. However, where CT is necessary, it should be used. Remembering that the American College of Radiology states that no single imaging study results in radiation exposure 
to a degree that would threaten the well-being of a developing fetus. Oral and IV contrast does cross the placenta but is not reported to be teratogenic. Transient elastography is shown to be safe in pregnancy, although it remains to be FDA approved in the USA, with some studies showing progressive increase in results during normal pregnancy with return to baseline after delivery. The need for liver biopsy during pregnancy is uncommon, but when needed can be safely performed without additional risk and can be considered when the results would impact the maternal management. In this slide, we summarise the approach to the pregnant woman who present with deranged liver function tests. On the flowchart on the left, you can see that those women who present with derangements in a hepatocellular pattern should be considered for disorders that can occur coincidentally during pregnancy. These, these disorders need to be excluded as well as considering whether the patient may have pregnancy-specific liver disorders. If the pattern of liver tests are more cholestatic, then the issue of biliary diseases should be considered with evaluation with further imaging when necessary. In the final schema, it this represents a summary of the potential disorders that we may need to manage during pregnancy from the management of women with underlying chronic liver disease, which may be from pre-pregnancy, through to disorders that happen to occur in pregnancy, such as viral hepatitis, and also, of course, the various disorders that are pregnancy specific. We'll hear about all of these disorders in further detail. Dear colleagues, I am Ibad Asaid, Professor of Hepatogastroenterology at Benha University, Egypt. And it's a great pleasure for me to be with you in this webinar organized by the World Gastroenterology Organization about pregnancy and liver, and my topic will be about pregnancy with cirrhosis. I'll try to cover this subject as scheduled within 10 to 12 minutes. And to, to cover such a subject, pregnancy with cirrhosis, I'll try to cover and to answer the following questions in my agenda. At first, what is the definition of and what is cirrhosis? What is the impact of cirrhosis on female fertility? What is the impact of cirrhosis on pregnancy? What is the impact of pregnancy on, on the pre-existing cirrhosis? What about drugs and interventions safety? And how to reach a peaceful pregnancy with cirrhosis? At first, cirrhosis is defined as an advanced stage of fibrosis. It's diffuse, fibro it's diffuse fibrosis characterized by the formation of regenerative nodules of the liver parenchyma that are separated by and encapsulated with fibrotic septa and associated with major angi architectural changes. So cirrhosis is just diffuse fibrosis with regeneration nodules and the presence of major angi architectural changes as illustrated in these histopathological images. Patients with cirrhosis typically have reduced fertility because of altered hypothalamic pituitary function and the impaired hepatic metabolism of sex hormones. Those will lead to secondary amenorrhea and the development of anovulatory cycles, especially as the severity of liver disease progresses. Although menstrual irregularities are common in cirrhosis, pregnancies occur with an estimated frequency of about 1 per 3,000 to 6,000 pregnancies, even in those with decompensated cirrhosis. As pregnancies would occur, there is a need for contraception in women with cirrhosis who wish to avoid pregnancy. In these patients, estrogen-containing contraceptive agents should be avoided, particularly in those with decompensated cirrhosis. All forms of emergency contraception may be used in the setting of chronic liver disease. Given improved maternal outcomes, as the recent data report maternal mortality rates of less than 2%, Cirrhosis and portal hypertension are no longer considered absolute contraindications to pregnancy. In patients seeking assistance with conception, keep in mind that in vitro fertilization, the IVF itself may be associated with liver dysfunction, which could worsen underlying liver cirrhosis. What about the impact of cirrhosis on pregnancy? In data from the, in data from the US nationwide inpatient sample, 
cirrhosis in pregnancy compared increased maternal and fetal mortality compared with controls. Regarding maternal mortality, it was 1.8% versus zero, while fetal, it was 5.2 versus 2.1. Cesar delivery, placental abruption, uterovaginal hemorrhage and gas, and gestational hypertension, preeclampsia, were also more common with cirrhosis. And the infants had higher rates of prematurity and growth restriction. Many of the physiological and hormonal changes that occur in pregnancy mimic those seen in patients with cirrhosis and port hypertension. The clinical consequences of these changes are the development of either de novo or worsening varices, ascites, or hepatic encephalopathy. This diagram illustrates that increases planking vasodilatation, the decreased systemic vascular resistance and the blood pressure, the increased portal flow and intrahepatic resistance, the increased collateral flow and the increased blood volume, all these events that occur physiologically during pregnancy. In a cirrhotic patient, they will exacerbate the presence of port hypertension and the clinical consequences will be increased variceal size and risk of variceal hemorrhage, increased ascites and increased hepatic encephalopathy. And about the impact of pregnancy on cirrhosis, the normal physiological change that I said that occurred during pregnancy predispose patients with cirrhosis to develop a greater degree of port hypertension, thus leading to potentially more complications, particularly variceal bleeding, which is the most feared complication with an 18 to 20% maternal mortality rate. Again, the most feared complication of pregnancy with cirrhosis is the risk of variceal bleeding. Risk is greatest during the second trimester when intravascular volume increases and during delivery due to compression of the inferior vena cava by the gravid uterus and through the repeated valsalva maneuvers during vaginal birth or inadvertent trauma to the intra-abdominal varices, mainly pelvic varices, during caesarean section. The incidence of splenic artery aneurysm and the rupture are increased during pregnancy and are even higher in the setting of port hypertension. As we all know, pregnancy is a hypercoagulability state and portal vein thrombosis may present. It will present to his abdominal pain and or liver decompensation and should it occur, would require anticoagulation and interventional radiologic consultation regarding the need for transjugular intrahepatic portosystemption or other radiological procedures. And to reach a peaceful pregnancy with cirrhosis, the model for end-stage liver disease, the MILD score, can be a helpful prognostic tool when counseling patients about the risk during pregnancy. As we all know, the MILD score depends on the serum bilirubin, INR, and serum creatinine, and will be used in an equation to get the score. Published data suggests that an antenatal MILD score of 10 or more has 83% sensitivity and specificity for predicting liver decompensation during pregnancy. So be cautious in a pre-cirrhotic patient with mild score more than 10 when she gets pregnancy. Surveillance endoscopy ideally should be performed within the year before pregnancy, as recommended by the SLD. 2021. As I said, leading esophageal or gastroesophageal viruses is the most feared complication as it is the main cause of maternal mortality in patients with cirrhosis during pregnancy. If esophagogastrogenoscopy is not performed before pregnancy, it is recommended to be done early in the second trimester or if there is ongoing liver injury or decompensation occurs. The presence of viruses will necessitate primary prophylaxis, which can consist of non either non-selective beta blockers and the propranolol is the preferred, or osophageal variceal ligation if medium or large viruses are identified. This figure illustrates the approach for screening of osophageal viruses in a, in a woman who is aiming to get pregnant. It is better to be done in the year before pregnancy or if not done, it will be done in the early second trimester 
and according to the presence of viruses and their size, the decision will be with either the use of non-selective beta blockers or variceal bad ligation until eradication to avoid the most feared complication of variceal bleed. <clears throat> Proclonolol, as I said, is the preferred non-selective beta blocker for pregnant women with acute variceal hemorrhage. If occurred, the standard therapy with octreotide or somatostatin will be applied beside proton pump inhibitors, antibiotic therapy with cephalosporins, and endoscopy will be done for intervention as recommended. Terlipressin should be avoided because it can cause uterine contractions and reduce uterine blood flow. <clears throat> Esophagogastrodiridinoscopy appears safe in pregnancy, with more than 95% of patients undergoing it, de delivering healthy infants. If possible, all endoscopic procedures should be deferred until the second trimester of pregnancy. For endoscopic procedures, midazolam, mepiridine, fentanyl, and the propofol are acceptable for use in pregnancy, with efforts to minimize the duration of anesthesia. They as short as possible, we have to minimize the duration of exposure to anesthesia. The FDA released a warning in 2017 about the possible risk of fetal brain damage and subsequent impairment of neurocognitive function after prolonged more than three hours or frequent exposure to general anesthetics and sedatives, including midazolam and full, which are considered safe, but as I said, for short periods during, if when used during the third trimester of pregnancy. Minimizing fetal exposure to anesthetic agents during pregnancy should be the goal. About the drug safety during pregnancy, most of the used drugs, unfortunately, are category C. And while mycophenolate, mofetine, and neomycin are category B, the exception of category B is cefotaxim, lactulose, octreotide, and some of the PPIs. So when dealing with a pregnant female, we have to keep in mind that most of the drugs are not 100% safe. The decision of continued medical treatment throughout pregnancy in patients with cirrhosis for chronic liver disease, such as Wilson's disease, hepatitis B, autoimmune hepatitis, which will all end in cirrhosis, should be made on a case-by-case -case basis to prevent an acute exacerbation of the underlying disease or that could lead to acute or chronic liver failure. Although ascites rarely occurs during pregnancy, there is no contraindication to the use of diuretics as medical management or lactulose or rifaximine for hepatic encephalopathy. Although some of these drugs are category C, however, most of the papers report that they are used safely safely in cirrhotic patients during pregnancy. Uh, however, the risk-benefit assessment should be considered. Spontaneous bacteria peritonitis is managed, is managed according to the standard society's guidelines, keeping in mind that cephalosporins or cephalosporins are generally safe. The decision on the mode of delivery in a pregnant patient with cirrhosis is based solely on the obstetrical determinants. For cesarean delivery, platelet counts should generally be greater than 50,000 per milliliter because of an increased risk for peri procedure and postpartum bleeding. Observation in an intensive care unit may be necessary. The take home message the normal physiologic changes that occur during pregnancy predispose patients with cirrhosis to develop a greater degree of porta hypertension. That thus leading to potentially more complications, especially an increased risk of variceal bleeding. Risk is greatest during the second trimester. All women with cirrhosis, particularly with prior hepatic decompensation or with MILD score at equal or more than 10, should be counseled on the risk of worsening liver disease during pregnancy. For pregnant women with a small gastroesophageal viruses, Primary prophylaxis using non-selective beta blockers, preferably propranolol, is considered, while with medium or large size gastroesophageal viruses, primary prophylaxis using band ligation that should continue until obliteration of viruses or using non-selective beta blockers is recommended. The decision on the mode of delivery in a pregnant woman with cirrhosis 
is based solely on the obstetrical demand. For cesarean delivery, platelet counts should be generally greater than 50,000 per milliliters, and postpartum observation in IC unit, IC unit is recommended. Thank you very much. First of all, I would like to welcome all of you to this uh, webinar. My task is to discuss with you viral hepatitis in pregnancy. This is the objective. I will discuss hepatitis B in pregnancy, mainly hepatitis B, C, and A. And I will discuss prevalence, a risk for mother-to-child transmission, maternal fetal outcome, prevention of mother-to-child transmission, treatment, and last, I will discuss the problem of breastfeeding. As you can see, for hepatitis B, the prevalence is different from country to country. And we can see that the prevalence is high in sub-Saharan Africa and low in Europe and United States. One important message, all pregnant female should be screened for this antigen as early as possible. This was a recommendation for all medical society, WHO, since many time ago. The risk factor for mother-to-child transmission are mainly two. Very meek mother with high viral load and E antigen positive pregnant woman. The risk is up to 3%, 30% uh, uh, according to viral load, and it is around 70 to 90% in E antigen positive mother. We have to stress that perinatal transmission is associated with a higher risk of developing chronic liver, uh, chronic HBV infection up to 95%. Here we have uh, the uh, evolution and the risk during pregnancy and after delivery. As you can see, the risk of flare can be happened during pregnancy in up to 12% and in postpartum period up to 44%. And in postpartum period, the flare occur generally in the six first month after delivery. How can we prevent mother to child transmission? All medical society and WHO stress that tenofovir must be the drug of choice for all women with high viremic load, 200,000. It, 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 we have to start this treatment generally between 24 and 28 weeks, and we have to stop it one month to three months after delivery. In low-income country, if we don't have access to HBV DNA, we can use E antigen as a marker to determine women who are eligible for tenofovir prophylaxis to prevent mother-to-child transmission. This recommendation is from WHO in 2020. How about the use of hepatitis B immunoglobulin to prevent mother-to-child transmission? Here we have a new recommendation from WHO in which tenofovir plus vaccination, including time birth dose, can be used to prevent uh, mother-to-child transmission without using hepatitis B immunoglobulin. Why this recommendation? This recommendation, it is based on the fact that uh, immunoglobulin are not available everywhere and the cost is high, a cold chain is uh, necessary. So 
this is not always available in low and middle income setting. Here we have a study coming from Cambodge, Cambodia, which, which show clearly that by using uh, tenofovir uh, plus vaccination in high risk mother, we can prevent uh, accurately the transmission from mother to child. Here, only four cases in 306 uh, women pregnant, the, uh, prevalent, the prevalence is only 1.3. That means that the association for 24 plus vaccination can be enough if uh, immunoglobin are not available. How can we treat hepatitis B in pregnant women? The tenofovir is the drug uh, of choice. Ontecavir is contraindicated and TAF, there is a great evidence to support the safety and efficacy of TAF, but it's still not recommended in routine use by all uh, medical society. Now let's move to hepatitis C. If the screening for hepatitis B is worldwide accepted for hepatitis C in most regions, universal screening of HCV in pregnant female is not recommended. Only few society like uh, uh, ICLD and CDC in United States recommend this kind of screening. How about the risk factor for mild to child transmission? This transmission can occur in 6% of case range between five to 15. And the high risk patient are patient with high vermic load, who infection with HIV, drug user mother, prologue the rupture of membrane, invasive fetal monitoring with fetal blood sampling and scalp electrode. Amniocentid is more safer than chorionic villus sampling. We have to avoid episiotomy and there is no difference for mother-to-child transmission between vaginal delivery versus cesarean section. How about the outcome in new child, newborn? Many complications can occur, intrauterine fetal death, preterm delivery, small for gestational age, and low uh, uh, birth weight infant, which can occur in 12.5%. In the mother, the main risk is gestational diabetes, preeclampsia, miscarriage, and antihepatic cholestasis, and the odor ratio is about 20. We have to note that after delivery, some patient, around 10% of patients, will spontaneously clear SVRNA. So we have to revaluate and we have to again perform PCR to check if. Uh, we need to treat or not according to uh, presence or absence of spontaneous clearance. Whom and when to treat? The best way is to screen female in, on a reproductive age and treat a patient before pregnancy because all they are not approved for use in pregnant women. But despite the lack of recommendation, treatment can be considered in case by case in pregnant women. And we have to discuss with patient according to the potential risk and benefit. Here we have some data from a small series in which uh, DAA, mainly sofosbuvir plus lidipasvir was used in pregnant women with uh, hepatitis C. And uh, those results show that the efficacy is good and the safety also is good. But we need more data on that. Let's move now to hepatitis E. If we see the prevalence, there is a big difference between low, medium uh, human development index and high and very high uh, country as we see here, for asymptomatic women, it is 5% in low and medium country and 2.6 in high and very high. But please see that the prevalence is higher, around 50% in symptomatic 
patient in low and medium human development index. The risk for vertical transmission is so high. In this meta-analysis, it was around 37%. What is the course of hepatitis E during pregnancy? It's extremely variable from mild to severe and fulminant hepatitis and can occur mainly in the third trimester. And we can also see that uh, from country to country and from region to region, the uh, gravity uh, and severity of hepatitis E during pregnancy is completely different. In India, we have often uh, fulminant hepatitis and dead in the mother. But for example, in Egypt, Europe, and United States, the course and severity during pregnancy is not different from that in no pregnant woman. Here, this meta-analysis show the risk and outcome in mat uh, uh, mat maternal fetal outcome. And we can see that stillbirth can occur with a other issue, 2.6. Antiretrine death can occur with an other issue, three. But the most important thing, see please here, the maternal death can occur with an older issue, seven mainly in low income country. For the treatment, unfortunately, we don't have a pro, uh, uh, recommended treatment in pregnant women because uh, rivabirin and pegylated uh, enterfen, which is the main treatment for hepatitis E, mainly in immunodepressed uh, 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 patient is contraindicated, contraindicated in pregnant women. So the best way to treat is prevention. How about vaccination? There is a vaccine from China, which also was improved in Pakistan, but it's not still recommended from many society. But WHO recommend this vaccine for outbreak response. And recently in 2000, uh, in 2023, uh, a panel for experts uh, say that we can use it with uh, in high risk setting, and uh, this uh, approach can be a logical approach. To conclude, uh, for breastfeeding, for breastfeeding for all three hepatitis, for hepatitis B and C, breastfeeding is safe but should be avoided when the nipple are cracked damage or bleeding, and the context of HIV co-infection for hepatitis E. Recently, uh, a study have shown that uh, uh, in the milk, we can have uh, ACV RNA. So it is probably advisable to consider interruption breastfeeding in women with acute hepatitis E infection. To conclude, I want to uh, give you some uh, take home message. All pregnant women should be screened for S antigen. In vermic patient, tenofovir plus vaccination with timely birth dose is a good option to prevent mild to child transmission, mainly in country with limited resource. For hepatitis C, treatment before pregnancy is the best option to prevent mild ma mother to child, trans uh, ma mother to child trans transmission. Hepatitis E can induce feminine hepatitis with high mortality in the mother in some country, mainly in Asia and India. Preventing hepatitis E infection in pregnancy may be the most important management strategy since we don't have drug for use in pregnant women. And for vaccine, it's not approved in many countries, but can be used for outbreak response. Thank you for your attention. Good day to everybody. My name is Cecilia Cabrera, and I'm going with the next topic of this webinar, chronic liver disease in pregnancy. This is the summary of my talk. We are going to speak something about autoimmune hepatitis, primarily biliary cholangitis, Wilson's disease, metabolic associated fatty liver disease, mouth LD, and liver mass. This is my disclosure. So let's start with autoimmune hepatitis of pregnancy. Autoimmune hepatitis is an inflammatory disease with a clear female predominance, four female to one male. So this is the reason that we are talking about this disease in this pregnancy webinar. Here we can have two situations. The first one is a rare scenario when we have the, the autoimmune hepatitis de novo, 
during pregnancy or within three months after delivery. In this case, we are going to treat like the standard guidelines. But the more frequent uh, situation is, is, is when we have the, an established I, AIH before pregnancy. And in this case, evolutions depend on the level of control of the disease one year before. That is, if we are not achieving a, a biochemical response one year before pregnancy, the outcomes should be worse. And the most common complication is the flare-ups of the autoimmune hepatitis. What is the explanation for this? First of all, autoimmune hepatitis is an inflammatory disease where we have a decrease of the T cells for regulation and an increase of the Th1 cells, which, which provokes a huge inflammatory liver activity. But pregnancy, on the opposite, induces an, inflama an anti-inflammation phenotype. And during the increase of estrogens and progesterone, we have an increase of the T cells for regulation and a decrease of the Th1 cells, which, which provokes a decrease in the inflammation liver activity. So what are the fatal outcomes we can expect? First of all, preterm birth with a relative risk of 3.21. And this complication is more frequent if we have these antigens positive, like anti rau SLA, and, AL, and LP positive. And the second is low birth weight with a relative risk of 2.51. We can have newborn admission to special care unit in an increased rate, especially if we, if we have a loss of biochemical response during the pregnancy, you know, a loss of biochemical response to autoimmune, autoimmune hepatitis. And recent data shows that there is not significant increased risk of congenital malformations because nowadays we know that acetoprene and corticosteroid are safe during pregnancy. There is not increased risk for neonatal mortality and for stillbirth. What about maternal outcomes during autoimmune hepatitis with pregnancy? First of all, the loss of biochemical response you know, or flare-ups, which occur and uh, which have worse outcomes if the woman is already cirrhotic. And these flare-ups can occur up to three months postpartum. Another complication is gestational diabetes mellitus with a relative risk of 4.35 and is not related to, corticost to corticosteroids, but is associated with autoimmune hepatitis. And we also can expect hypertensive complication in pregnancy like as preeclampsia, eclampsia, with a relative risk of more than five. And another time, this is especially associated with autoimmune hepatitis in, and not also to chronic liver disease. Those were the facts and which are the actions to take. First of all, preconception counseling. We have to discuss with our patient where, when is the best moment to get pregnant, and that is when the disease is controlled. And we have to get ready for that moment. Talk about pros, cons, and, um, and medication to use. Uh, we can start folic acid before pregnancy and during the first trimester. This is very important. Keep immunosuppressive treatment. We know, and we, nowadays we know that prednisone, prednisolone, nasatoprine are safe during, during pregnancy, and that prevents the loss of biochemical response of the autoimmune hepatitis. Budesonide could be better, but not if our patient is rotic or if she has acute liver failure. And in, what do we know is that mycophenolate is contraindicated during pregnancy. About breastfeeding, that's okay. Corticoid with corticosteroids and, and asatoprine, but a nurse should be better if, if we do that four hours after the intake of these drugs. We also have to think in prevention of hypertensive complication. 
uh, we can use aspirin from the 12 or 16 weeks of, of gestation because of the risk of eclampsia or preeclampsia. Check glucose during pregnancy because of gestational diabetes mellitus and uh, keep a close monitoring, not just by the gynecologist, uh, but but for the with a hepatologist. Another disease which is very important is primarily biliary cholangitis. The facts here is that that, that is so limited right now about the disease, but uh, in that it is reported that preterm birth is up to thirty percent in a huge and in a large study. Um, we also can see the worsening of pruritus, but in general, we can expect good outcomes for mother and child. Which are the actions to take in these situations? Keep treatment, especially we are talking about utca, which is safe, but uh, ovaricolic acid is not used in pregnancy because there is not enough data during pregnancy. For pruritus, use safely antihistamines, cholesterol, naltrexone, or rifampicin. And again, we have to close monitor our patient uh, by the pathologist and the gynecologist. What about Wilson's disease? The fact is, if untreated in, the, in this, uh, this disease, we can expect reduced fertility and an increased rate of spontaneous abortions. We don't know that the, the the penicillamine and trentine have potential teratogenic uh, effects, but zinc is kind of safe in, in pregnancy. But the most important thing that we, that we have to remember is that stopping treatment during Wilson disease provokes worse outcomes to mother and child. So the actions to take here is another time preconception counseling, discuss, discuss pros and cons, keep treatment, but try to reduce the doses during the first trimester. ASLD have the recommendation to reduce the doses between 20, 20 to, to 50% and uh, keep a close monitoring of our patient. Another situation is morphology and pregnancy, where, which are the facts here. The fact here is, especially in the Western world, we have a high prevalence of mafaldi, up to 22% of persons between 30 and 39 years old. So 30 to 39 years old, we have a lot of women with, that are in the age to get pregnant. And here, obesity is the most important risk factor to have mafaldi. And the type two diabetes mellitus is the most important clinical predictor of adverse outcomes. For example, we have in this group of type two diabetes mellitus, 50, 55% of NAFLE, almost 40% of NASH. And in this group, we can have 16% of significant, significant fibrosis, no, which is very important. And because of this, we can see in this group, these complications, which are gestational diabetes mellitus, that is more frequent if we have nafaldi, and preeclampsia with a relative risk of more than six, and infants large for gestational age with an OR more than four. So we have an epidemic of obesity, of, uh, of diabetes, and we are seeing more patients with mafaldi, and mafaldi is associated also with this maternal bad outcomes in pregnancy. So which are the actions to take? Prevention, again, prevention. We have, we have to think in mafaldi in, in patients, you know, check for this disease in obese women, in, in women with diabetes, and then discuss to do to them that if they want to get pregnant and ha and, and they want a healthy pregnancy when a, with a healthy newborn, they have to start dietary restriction, habitual physical activity in order to achieve so. 
And last, liver masses on pregnancy. The fact here is that hemangioma and focal, uh, focal nodular hyperplasia, which are the most common benign tumors in liver, are not associated with an increased risk of, or in during pregnancy. But hepatocellular adenoma, we, uh, they can enlarge during pregnancy, and we can see an increase in the hepatic rupture risk if this adenoma is more than five centimeters. Another disease that we can see here is hepatocellular carcinoma, especially in the group of cirrhotic patients. Here, the evolution is more aggressively, maybe because of the state of the immunodepression during pregnancy, and we can expect more an increase in mortality for the mother and the fetus. Which are the actions to take here? Well, the diagnosis is almost in every, in every case by imaging. Biopsy is not recommended, just in special cases. Uh, we just have to monitor with ultrasound if we are talking about hepatos of hepatocellular adenoma. We do not have to monitor hemangioma or focular nodular hyperplasia. And in order to avoid hepatocellular carcinoma in pregnant women, we have to, uh, first of all, discuss with our patient contraception strategies and uh, and keep the HCC screening every time, every six months. Finally, take home message of this little talk. Liver disease affects pregnancy and multidisciplinary management is mandatory, as we can see in all the talk. The best strategy is prevention, uh, preconception counseling and healthy lifestyle. And, um, and I think a pathologist and a patient should work as a team, not with the um, thinking that let's get ready together to achieve a healthy pregnancy and a healthy child. Thank you for your attention. Today, I'm going to talk about two pregnancy-specific liver diseases which are ICP and HELP syndrome. To start with the ICP or intrahepatic cholestasis of pregnancy, this is the most common liver disease unique to pregnancy with an incidence ranging from one to 27% of all pregnancies. We have some risk factors like multiple gestations, previous hepatitis C infection and advanced maternal age. Of course, we have some proposed etiologies, including genetic susceptibility with some accused genes, besides the effect of reproductive hormones and hormonal changes within the pregnancy, with an extra added environmental factors like selenium concentrations and seasonal variations of the year. The most important and first presentation of ICB is prioritis, the itching which is usually generalized, starts and predominates on the palms and soles, and more worse at night. Uh, some patients complain of right hypochondrial pain and some GIT symptoms like nausea and poor appetite. By examination, we can find the scratch marks, the excoriations, but never primary skin lesions. Jones occurs in 14 to 25% of patients and usually develop between one to four weeks after the onset of itching. Uh, the elevation in serum total bile acid concentrations is the key laboratory findings, and the cutoff value for bile acid is 10 micromole per liter, which is usually uh, elevated or exceeded in more than 90% of the affected pregnancies. This elevation in bile acid could be the first and only laboratory abnormality in patient with ICB. The uh, levels of bile acid is the most important in considering or defining the severe cases, which is usually uh, more than 40 micromole bile acids, and this occurs in 20% of cases. We can also find some elevations in transaminases, usually less than two folds, some elevation in alkaline phosphatase despite being non-specific for cholestasis in pregnancy, elevation in bilirubin in about a quarter of patients with ICD. 
ultrasound is usually free with no uh, bile uh, tract abnormalities or intrahepatic bile duct abnormality. And liver biopsy is not usually used for the diagnosis. Uh, although we can find by histopathology cholestasis without evidence of inflammation. The maternal bile acid can cross the placenta, uh, causing some intrahepatic uh, fetal or some fetal complications, like the fetal gross uh, retardation, the premature birth, the econium stained amniotic fluid, unita respiratory distress syndrome, arrhythmias for the fetal, fetal distress, or even still. Uh, as stated, the level of bile acid is more important and the risk of fetal complication is correlated with the level of bile acids being uh, more with concentrations more than 100 micromole per liter. The targets for treatment is to reduce symptoms, especially uh, itching, and to reduce the risk of perinatal morbidity and mortality. All patients with ICP are candidates for treatment. The timing for, uh, of delivery is very important, and again, we rely on the concentrations of the bile acid. If the bile acid's concentration is less than 40, uh, so we can have delivery at 37 or 38 weeks, maybe plus six weeks according to the case. If bile acid is from 40 to 99, so we have delivery from 36 to 37 weeks. If the bile acid is more than 100, so we have to consider other factors uh, uh, defining the severity of the case, like having severe unrelieved itching or worsening of liver function or previous history of fetal demise in this female. If these scenarios are present, we have to arrange for delivery between the 34th to the 36 weeks of gestations. But if we don't have these uh, warning uh, uh, signs, so we can postpone delivery to 36 uh, weeks or more. Also, the oxycholic acid is the main uh, medical treatment that, that we can use uh, targeting to uh, improve itching. We start with a dose of 300 milligram uh, capsule three times a day or maybe two times a day and we can titrate and increase the dose if no response to about 21 milligram per kg per day. We usually expect a decrease in itching uh, within one to two weeks and a biochemical response uh, after three to four weeks of its uh, start. For the non-responding cases, we can add uh, s adenosyl methionine, cholesteramine, or even rifampicin. Um, after delivery, uh, everything goes normal. Uh, lab investigation normalized, itching disappears. We have no problem with uh, breastfeeding in patient with ICB. And if follow-up revealed still abnormalities, then we have to consider and assess for another hepatobiliary disease. The second is the HELP syndrome, and HELP syndrome accounts for hemolysis, elevated liver enzymes, and low platelet count. Um, it represents a severe form of preeclampsia, or could be a separate disorder from uh, preeclampsia. Uh, HELP syndrome typically develops between 28 and 37 weeks of gestation, but could occur at the late trimester or at term or postpartum, this is also common, and it occurs in about 0.1 to 1% of all pregnancies. Proteinuria occurs in the majority of cases, or even most of cases. Uh, hypertension occurs in more than 80% of cases. Patients also could complain of right hypochondrial pain, nausea, vomiting, headache, visual change, or even joints. For diagnosis, we have some diagnostic criteria. We have to establish the diagnosis of hemolysis, but at least two of the following, peripheral smear uh, with evidence of hemolysis, serum bilirubin elevation, loose serum haptoglobin or elevation LDH more than two times, severe anemia uh, unrelated to blood loss, 
this is for hemolysis, in addition to elevation level enzymes more than two folds, low platelet count less than 100 thousands. We have some uh, classification and staging systems to classify cases of uh, HELP syndromes. The most famous is the Mississippi classification, uh, classifying HELP syndrome to three stages. The first stage, which uh, or class, which is the most severe one, with a platelet count less than 50,000, ALTST elevation more than 70, LDH more than 600. The second class is a platelet count between 50,000 and 100,000, uh, AST and ALT elevation more than 70, and LDH more than 600. The third or the milder class is uh, with platelet count between 100,000 and 150,000, elevation in AST or ALT just above normal, more than 40, and LDH more than 600. We have some groups of patients who are requiring urgent assessment uh, or even intervention uh, with HELP syndrome, including patients with severe hypertension who should receive antihypertensive therapy even by intravenous route, a patient with abnormal fetal heart, heart rate, patient with severe right hypochondrial pain, which could consider the occurrence of hepatic bleeding or even hepatic rupture, and the serious complications like DIC or pulmonary edema or acute kidney injury. Hepatic bleeding is a serious or the most serious and fatal complications. It occurs in about 1% of cases, but we have to consider it in patients with severe high hypochondrial pain as stated. Uh, the hematoma may remain contained or even rupture, and it is usually uh, managed conservatively and surgery is rarely uh, needed. This is a CT uh, of a case of uh, large uh, subcapsular hematoma, and the other one is a case of uh, irregular perfusion defects. To treat HELP syndrome, we have to consider blood transfusion, uh, uh, back to RBCs, uh, platelet transfusion in some cases with uh, uh, bleeding, or even if platelet count is less than 20,000, uh, plasma transfusion could be also considered. Uh, the patient should maintain bed rest and continuous monitoring for the mother and the fetus. We may use magnesium sulfate, uh, sulfate to prevent seizures and convulsions. We have to treat hypertension with the medications, and we may use corticosteroids for fetal lung development in some cases. The candidates for prompt delivery are pregnancies with uh, more than 34 weeks of gestations, pregnancies that have not reached a stage of fetal maturity that ensures a reasonable chance of extra uterine survival, pregnancies with fetal demise or placental abruption. In the absence of any of these urgent clinical scenarios, delivery may be delayed until a course of antenatal corticosteroids have been administered. For the uh, maternal outcomes, bleeding can occur in more than half of the cases, the IC in more than one-fifth of cases, placental abruption, acute kidney injury, subcapsular hematoma in 1%, retinal detachment, and this even in 1% of cases. For the fetal and the maternal uh, outcomes, the overall perinatal mortality rate is from 7 to 20%. The preterm birth is common, about 70%. And in patients with HELP who become pregnant again, 7% of those can develop HELP in subsequent pregnancy. And thank you. <music>
and accounts for 25% of serious maternal complications, including death. Preeclampsia is characterized by new onset hypertension and proteinuria, typically presenting after 20 weeks of gestation, and characterized by hypertension and proteinuria, or hypertension and end organ dysfunction with or without proteinuria. And the end organ dysfunction may present with platelet, low platelet counts, uh, increased creatinine uh, levels, and liver dysfunction, pulmonary edema, knee onset or persistent headache, and visual symptoms. The risk factors for preeclampsia are nulliparity, multifetal gestation, previous preeclampsia, positive family history, older maternal age, and pregnancy with assisted reproductive technologies. And also pregnant women with comorbidities such as pre-existing kidney or vascular disease, autoimmune diseases, chronic hypertension, pre-gestational or gestational diabetes, obesity, and antiphospholipid antibody syndrome are under the risk of preeclampsia. Placental dysfunction is central to the development of preeclampsia. The decrease in uterine blood flow results in ischemia and increases placental oxidative stress and there is an imbalance between the pro- and anti-angiogenic factors uh, which leads to endothelial dysfunction. As a result, fetal complications and also maternal complications with end organ involvement occur. 85% of patients present with knee onset hypertension and proteinuria after 34 weeks of gestation and sometimes during labor, and 10% develop signs and symptoms uh, earlier than 34 weeks of gestation, which is defined as early onset preeclampsia, and rarely it can be as early as between 20 to 20 second week, and uh, only in 5% the presentation may be uh, postpartum and it can be seen within 48 hours of uh, birth. Symptoms and signs of preeclampsia include severe headache, blurred vision or scotoma, epigastric or right upper quadrant pain, nausea and vomiting, sudden swelling of face, hands and feet are the most commonly reported symptoms and in 25% of patients severe hypertension can be seen and chest pain, dyspnea and low platelet counts appear to be predictive of fatal or life-threatening complications. The laboratory findings include elevated aminotransferases, ASD is initially higher than ALT and median uh, ALT levels are approximately around 200 uh, and LDH uh, can be increased and mild hyperuricemia and indirect hyperbilirubinemia uh, can be seen because of uh, hemolysis. So how is the cause of disease? In most patients, maternal signs and symptoms resolve in the postpartum period and headache disappears in hours, resolution of proteinuria may take weeks or months, and hypertension may worsen during the first, occasionally second postpartum week, but in most patients it normalizes within four weeks after delivery. How about the maternal and fetal outcomes? In US and UK cohorts, maternal mortality was reported to be 6 per 100,000 pregnancies, while in low- and middle-income countries, it was reported to 40 per 100,000 pregnancies, which is a significant difference. And also, the fetal complications include intrauterine growth retardation and oligohydroamnios, and also preeclampsia, uh, presenting before the week of 34 increases the perinatal morbidity and mortality. Prophylaxis with aspirin should be considered for women at high risk and uh, should be started before 16th week of gestation and continued until delivery. And there is no established role for magnesium, antioxidants and other nutritional supplements. 
the evidence of multi-organ involvement and the need for hospital admission should be assessed. Severe hypertension should be treated and mother and fetus should be closely monitored and optimize delivery time, prevent seizures, continue close monitoring postpartum. And definitive treatment is delivery. And timing of delivery depends upon gestational age, severity of preeclampsia, maternal and fetal condition. And delivery is indicated for pregnancies over 34 weeks of gestation. And in the case of viable fetus and preeclampsia before 34 weeks of gestation, uh, betamazone, a course of antenatal corticosteroids, is indicated. Let's move on. Acute fatty liver of pregnancy, which is characterized by maternal liver dysfunction and failure, which leads to maternal fetal complications and death. Prompt delivery and support to maternal care is required and acute fatty liver of pregnancy is an obstetric emergency. Epidemiological studies reported the incidence 1 in 7,000 to 20,000 pregnancies. No ethnic or regional variability is apparent. It's unique to pregnancy and affects only women, and this condition can affect any woman of child-bearing age. The risk factors of fatty liver of pregnancy include first pregnancy, multifetal pregnancy, male fetus, low body mass index, prior episode of fatty liver of pregnancy, and fetal long chain fatty acid dehydrogenase deficiency, and preeclampsia and HELP syndrome. Defects in fatty acid metabolism during pregnancy is responsible for the pathogenesis. Long chain fatty acid dehydrogenase is found on the mitochondrial membrane and involves the beta oxidation of long chain fatty acids. And when there is a mutation, this leads to the enzyme deficiency. And this gene mutation is recessive and outside of pregnancy, under normal physiological conditions, women have normal fatty acid oxidation. But if the fetus is homozygous for this mutation, it will be unable to oxidize the fatty acids and these acids are passed to the mother's circulation. Because of the diminished enzyme function, the mother's mitochondria cannot metabolize the fatty acids and the mitochondria uh, becomes overwhelmed. As a result of fatty acid accumulation in the mother's liver, microvesicular steatosis, increased reactive oxygen species, increase in inflammatory pathways and apoptosis, and subsequent liver failure occurs. Typical presentation is between week 30 to 38, can be as early as 18 weeks or four days after delivery. The symptoms are nonspecific. Jaundice is present in the majority of patients and overlapping uh, features with HELP and preeclampsia can be seen. Complications are hepatic encephalopathy, AKI, pulmonary edema, GI bleeding, ascites, multi-organ failure, and postpartum hemorrhage. Swansea criteria include symptoms, laboratory findings, and imaging, and also developed as a di diagnostic model, which was validated in a cohort study. And six or more criteria is consistent with the diagnosis, and it's not useful in distinguishing fatal liver of pregnancy from other causes of acute liver failure, and help and preeclampsia limits the clinical utility of uh, this criteria. For the differential diagnosis, causes of acute liver injury or acute liver failure unrelated to pregnancies such as acute viral hepatitis, DLE, autoimmune hepatitis, Wilson's disease, or vascular or ischemic etiologies, gallstone diseases should be ruled out. And preeclampsia and HALP may coexist. 
and hypertension and preeclampsia were reported in 20 to 70 percent of women presenting with fatty liver of pregnancy. And omnitransphases are generally lower than 500 units. And if the omnitransphases are higher than 1,000, then we need to be suspicious about hepatic infarction or rupture. And hypoglycemia, hypofibrinogenemia, and hyperuricemia are more common in fatty liver of pregnancy. Imaging studies have low sensitivity for the diagnosis, but uh, it may exclude the liver mass, biliary disease, thrombosis, and also CT scan may show decreased or diffuse attenuation of liver. Liver biopsy is not indicated to confirm the diagnosis, and these patients have also coagulopathy, and biopsy can be considered if the liver synthetic functions fail to return to normal after delivery, and in women with non-classic presentations who are not close to term, and the biopsy specimens show diffuse centrilobular microvesicular steatosis. Prompt delivery, regardless of gestational age, initiates resolution of life-threatening disease, and patients with signs of ALF should be transferred to a referral center for liver transplant evaluation. And we need to assess multi-organ dysfunction and severity of liver dysfunction with comprehensive biochemical tests. And fetal monitoring is important, especially in pregnancies earlier than a week 32, magnesium sulfate administration reduces the risk of cerebral palsy and severe motor dysfunction. Therapeutic plasma exchange may be an option for severe disease. For ALF, liver transplantation should be considered. And MALT score equal or over 30 was found to be associated with increased risk of maternal complications. Major causes of maternal mortality and morbidity are hemorrhage, liver failure, and kidney injury. With early diagnosis, prompt delivery, and critical care, mortality rates decreased less than 5% over the past decade, and liver function returns to normal in 7 to 10 days. Children born to mothers with AFLP should be monitored for manifestations of enzyme deficiencies, especially for hypoglycemia. And all patients with AFLP and their children should undergo molecular testing. In my last slide, I would like to uh, wrap up pregnancy-specific liver diseases. Maternal features are similar uh, in all. Multifetal pregnancy is an important risk factor uh, for all. Time of presentation is generally uh, the, at the third trimester, but fetal liver of pregnancy may also present in the second trimester and rarely a uh, postpartum period. The typical presenting symptoms are similar, and for ICP, pruritis is an important sign. And ALT levels may increase up to 15% in fatty liver of pregnancy and uh, also with an acute liver failure uh, presentation. Uh, hyperuricemia is marked uh, and also hyperbilirubinemia uh, is, uh, can be marked in fatty liver of pregnancy. In preeclampsia and health, ALT levels are generally less than 500, and thrombocytopenia, hemolysis, hemolytic anemia, LDH elevation, mild hyperuricemia, and normal bilirubin, generally normal bilirubin levels are observed. And in ICP, ALT levels are variable. It can be up to eight per, uh, times the upper uh, limit of normal, and serum bile acid concentration is increased, and these patients have normal bilirubin. And imaging findings are not specific, but um, in fatty liver of pregnancy, fatty infiltration, bright liver, and ascites can be observed. And in health and preeclampsia, ascites can also be observed, and hepatic infarction or hematoma uh, can be observed. And in ICP, 20 to 30% of patients have gallstones. 
Early diagnosis and when diagnosed, prompt delivery is very important and timely management of uh, these patients uh, is very important for mortality uh, and morbidity of those patients. Thank you. Thank you very much for your patience. I'm sure that you'll agree that it's been a very informative session. Please feel free to write your queries on the chat box and we'll endeavour to address as many as possible. We'll be following up with a quick survey after this and we'd be grateful if you could please send through your responses. Again, thank you for your attendance, for your time and for all of your attention. Thank you.